morning I want to thank the team. This long selection, I think every week, I love probably every song, but uh, this morning very appreciative of the way it has flowed. Glad that you could join with us today, uh, whether in person or online. Uh, if you're online, if we haven't seen you in a while, uh, we miss you, so we're glad you're on the other end there. Can't wait to see you. Um, maybe you're watching this after the fact, it's, you're traveling or whatnot. Uh, either way, we're glad that you're here. Last week, um, we started off just a free two-part series called Across the Street and Around the World. So maybe you missed it, wondering what in the world does that mean? Well, we actually had a guest speaker by the name of Andy Howard, who was able to join and share about two local uh, mission ministry opportunities. One with the Hope Center, which is where Andy and I first met, along with uh, a number of our students from the youth group that have served there for a couple of years. Um, that is still going on every Tuesday, and you talk about all the different shifts that you can do from picking up the food from the local food banks to packing it all on the afternoon shift where a lot of times they feed you Chick-fil-A, so hey, there you go. Um, and then the shift typically that, that we would be a part of, uh, I've seen some of our congregation be out there for and mainly uh, our students, is the afternoon shift. And uh, it begins around 3.30, uh, 5.30 on Pinewood Tabernacle every Tuesday as a very shameless plug uh, for them. Uh, if you're interested in serving there, you can certainly um, reach out to Andy. We sent out his uh, his email and phone number, I think. Um, go ahead and spam him. And then uh, you can also reach out to me and I'll get you in touch. There is a, a new person who directs all the volunteers and the way that they go about that is a little different now, so I'd be glad to get you plugged in uh, to any of those shifts. I think the I need coming up was somebody who's going to drive a truck with a trailer and do the food stops in the morning every once in a while because they got the, the guy who normally does that faithfully is going to be phasing out for a season. I think there's some things he has to take care of. Um, so um, plenty of opportunities there. We have a great relationship with them. And then he spoke of another opportunity, uh, really a mission with a company. Uh, so they're working on a mission right now and developing the company that will support it, not the 501c3. Legitimate company that's going to sell artistic t shirts uh, made by people, uh, uh, some of them living, who have them living on the streets, and then to, to sell those and then support the mission to help those families uh, and those individuals kind of get on their feet a little bit. Partnering in that whole thing with the Cherry Street Mission. So um, if you weren't here last week, that may be news to you if you didn't catch online. I would encourage you to go back and watch, even if you don't watch uh, my portion of, of the message, you would watch. Andy's portion of the message, uh, it's hard to follow that up, honestly, so I just feel like I bumbled around like an idiot for a while afterwards and tried to bring it home a little bit. So I'm going to recap just for a minute about this idea of uh, being across the street and around the world. We think of across the street, we think of uh, maybe literally across the street um, in the neighborhoods. That's why I love kind of being tucked near some neighborhoods. Um, nothing wrong with a church somewhere else or out in the country, but enjoy where we're at, uh, not just because I can walk to work because I live two minutes away, but um, because I enjoy being able to minister with you guys in a local setting, affecting people nearby. We've had opportunities to do that as we have served and loved our neighbors in some practical ways throughout the last few years. I'm grateful for being a part of a church that's willing to do that and continue to do so. Um, as I was preparing for this message, um, it, it occurred to me that it is quite difficult uh, to prepare something and also be dealing with something at home. And so there's a time throughout this week, and I want to take a pastoral moment just to share with you. Um, not that the, the pulpit is a, a place where a pastor comes to air all of his dirty laundry or any of his grievances, but I thought this would be a, a neat way to show you just a peek inside of the life of the pastor. So, um, Malachi, uh, my son, is sitting over there. Would you join me on stage real quick, buddy? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. So gonna... It didn't go how I envisioned. <laughs> Can I talk about you for a second? 
<laughs> uh, parenting is interesting. And uh, I had an opportunity to show the gracious love of Christ to my son this week, and I, and I failed in that opportunity. He did something he wasn't supposed to do. That's why we've, we've talked about it, and I was going to try to air his laundry, but something we had talked about a few different times. And it, it didn't just make me mad. It, it pulled a whole monster, rage monster to me, like just right in that moment. Um, and I like to think I typically don't raise my voice, but I think I raised it so that the neighbors thought they, I was yelling at their kids too, even though I was inside my house. And so, uh, raised my voice probably to the point of sin and anger and really probably out of, out of pride as I added on to that as he was heading up the stairs and I was giving in a couple of extra words for good measure. Um, and really, honestly, um, it made me feel in such a way that I thought, how in the world can I preach a gospel proclaiming the good news of Christ to the nations and yet be so caught up in my anger in my very own home? And that's kind of the tension I want to walk with you guys today. And so really why I wanted to bring Malachi up here was not to say he's a bad kid and he did bad things. We had a father-son moment out um, under the tree out front and got to talk about responsibility and ownership of actions and taking care of your younger siblings with love and gentle tenderness. Um, but also the realization that, that dad probably has too much expectations of a six-year-old to be this young leader of the house. So my expectations far outpace the ability of probably any six-year-old to handle that. And recognizing that is a good thing. Also recognize that I sinned in my anger. I really did. I had, a, I had a pride about it. And so I asked guys for forgiveness and we hugged it out. And I just wanted to say, uh, Malachi, I love you very, very much. And I will uh, do my best. you sanctified in Christ. I said, never do that again. We started off last week uh, across the street and around the world with um, some passages uh, namely in Luke chapter 10, um, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. To go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. So he's calling us to go and to reach people in places nearby and far away. It's interesting this morning as I was um, just practicing what I was going to say up in my office as I often do on a Sunday morning. Um, I heard somebody talking back to me and I thought, Lord, yes, um, saying hello, hello. And I realized that I had pocket dialed somebody. I, Somebody local, it was a local phone call. I'm sorry about that. I don't know who it was, but um, they, got a, they got the gospel message. Um, that was nearby. I remember a few years ago, um, just happened to be my son, Kai. Sorry, God. Kai. He got a phone like any good toddler does and somehow knows how to magically dial numbers. And he called, I think, somewhere in like West Africa. Um, when I finally looked it up, and I called the, the company, so he called somebody around the world. I called the company and I said, well, what, is there any way, that was just an accident, my three-year-old son, you can see the call was like 27 seconds. I, I don't know anybody over there, it was a total accident. Can you, you know, have grace on me and remove that $7 charge? <laughs> and they said, uh, no, but we can remove the long distance feature temporarily from your phone until you tell us to turn that off. Fantastic. Let's do that. But I think often as Christians, we see needs immediately around us, and maybe in a regional sense, or even in a national sense, as we see what's going on and we want to give to the best efforts. But have we turned off the long distance feature to our mission's heart? And so, speaking to the heart of the mission, last week we said that it really begins with the compassion for souls. This is just a quick recap. I quoted that evangelism begins with a compassion born of a proper assessment of the massive character of the problem. That heaven is real, but so is hell. Our compassion is born out of an eternal plight, gut-wrenching agony over the hell that the masses of humanity are heading towards. We have compassion for 
for the lost. The other part of that is prayer for the workers. We have a heart for the prayer for the workers. To be sent out and to then us, our own selves, to consider being sent. It also involves, involves an urgency to go and to make disciples. That our time is fleeting, that there may not be much time left. We really don't know. But we know there is an end. And we know we need to take advantage of the time that we have. The, last, or the, the fourth thing was just an awareness of the persecution. Being sent out like lambs among wolves. That we can face some trying and difficult times of suffering as we minister. And lastly, that, that we can trust in the Lord as he sends us into our great commission. So I'm going to read uh, uh, briefly this great commission, and then we'll get into some main points for today. Across the street and around the world. We're going to live in Matthew chapter 8, 16 to 20. Um, so you can open that if you have the scriptures in front of you. We'll put some verses on the screen as well as we go. Matthew chapter 28. 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so what I want to give today, in light of this passage, is some considerations of the commission. And I think that there can be a mixed review when we read these words. What is God really calling us to do? What is this great commission? So I'm going to break that down into some basic considerations, not going to cover probably the enormity of the depth of information that we probably should cover, uh, just based on the time that we have today. I have no, uh, I have no missions, um, I'm not a missions expert, although I do have some experience serving, um, not overseas, but across the border, barely, uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, but I do have friends, and, and then we do have friends here that we support. Uh, on a yearly basis that are, that are scattered throughout the nations. So, the things to consider as we say, yes, we, we reach our neighbors and we've got things that we can plug into. And as a pastor, I, I actually got a phone call this week and I love getting these phone calls um, about the way that there's, some, there's a family in our church. And I, I get other calls like this. It's not just one family. There's a family in our church that has met not only the needs of this person, time and again, selfishly, sac sacrificially, but also the needs of like all of their immediate neighbors, time and time and time again. So, so there is this great work to be done, and, and the workers are out doing the work, and we're a part of that. But we also have to um, say, okay, what does that look like for us when it comes to being sent to the nations? Uh, there's some overlap. But there are some specific things that we can understand and consider as we go, no matter where we go. But I think today, to maybe put in your mind um, this idea that there's a greater mission field, not that ours is not great, but there's a mission field beyond these borders. I'm not just talking about our state, I'm talking about our country. The first thing that we can kind of rest in, though, as we go and make disciples, is the command is in God's authority. The first thing is that the command is in God's authority. We saw in verse 18, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But then we look at it, Luke 24, 45 to 47, that he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them that this is what is written, that Christ will suffer, and rise from the dead, and on the third day, in on repentance, and, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We have a local context within the scriptures of the early church. 
We say we're going to reach those that are nearby. We're going to reach the Jew, and we're also going to reach the Gentile. But we're going to do so because Christ has the authority. The authority has been given to him. We hear the name authority. I think we can think of a couple of things. We've seen people who have had authority in our lives and have given that authority very, very well and taken great responsibility with it to love and care and tell us forward. We also have had opportunities where authority has been abused, has become a power struggle, has been used uh, in sin against us. So this may be a word that is difficult to add in and say, well, God is the authority. Uh, we saw earlier, he, he's the beginning and the end. He is Alpha. He is Omega. He is Creator and Sustainer. He has given Christ authority to proclaim to us our directives for the world the life that we live. There is no higher authority. He is the only authority. And He is one who can be trusted in. And we can rest in that. Which I think is a really cool thing. I think it sets us free to say, all right, God is, God is on the throne. Christ is involved. The Spirit indwells inside of me. And I have been given a mission. And not just some willy-nilly mission to go and do something entirely meaningless, but to live on mission in my life where every day matters, even the mundane little diaper changes that happen every day. <laughs> Those things matter. We're on mission. We're on mission in our home and maybe primarily to begin with in our home. And then in our community and then our nation and around the world. That the authority, the authority is the same and flows through. Like we can, we can go and we can rest. That Christ has called us. He's given us our directive, our, our marching orders, if you will. We're thankful for it. Even though we struggle with it. And there's a tension there that we're trying to navigate today. The second thing is this. And, I, and for, for one, I'm grateful, and I think we should all be grateful for the gospel is for everyone everywhere. I think I've even probably said this before. If you've ever heard me preach, I think somehow I was in there talking about others, reaching others, reaching beyond our walls. The gospel is for everyone, everywhere. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. I'm obligated both to Greek and non-Greek, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. The gospel is for everyone, everywhere. And this is true not just among the nations, but among the grocery stores among the school system, among our family and our neighbors and the day-to-day -day of which we go. That we are looking around, casting a broad net. Not saying it's easy, and it doesn't come with sacrifice, or that I do it all that well myself. But trying to be mindful that when you go to a place, that I can look around and say the gospel is for these people. And I do not know the heart of man. And honestly, a lot of the times when I've tried to have this mindset and then engage in conversation, I'm talking to a Christian already. So I'm at Circle K getting a very large Diet Mountain Dew just a couple days ago as I'm preparing this message. I needed a little more caffeine. And there's a gentleman standing next to me, patiently waiting. Just seemed like a nice guy. He had a really cool hat on, and um, I look for different ways to engage with people and to say, this isn't everyone. I'm preaching this message, and here I am. I may never see this guy again. All right, the pressure's on. And he's got this really cool hat, and I'm like, perfect. Well, guys love hats. So he looked kind of bald, too, so I, I said, sir, I love your hat. And we engage in, in pleasantries, and then... Uh, he talks about just the, the kind of the joy of the life that he gets to live and the opportunity to meet somebody nice like me. And I was like, that's kind of cool. 
and um, has a lot of energy, and then he references his age and how old his kids are. And I, my jaw hit the floor. I thought, there's no way this guy is this old or has kids that are that age. I'm like, you are lying. So, like I've asked probably many people, what is your secret to be so vibrant and so youthful looking? Um, can you give me some of that? And uh, I really was prepared for different answers, an <laughs> opportunity to kind of slip the gospel in there and say, whoa, here you go. And his response was, Jesus! <laughs> and I thought, here I am preaching to another Christian. In the moment, I was joy to meet a Christian and to hear that and to, to then talk for 10 minutes. Um, but it seems like every time I think of everyone, everywhere, recently, and I go to finally work up the courage to engage, and I sweat it out, I've got anxiety, fear, and everything, and I, I'm preaching to believers. So either there's a lot of believers, or I've met all of the believers, and they are now evangelized again, <laughs> or God is somehow positioned me to preach to saved people. Maybe to encourage them. But also maybe to encourage all of us that you really have no idea. It's all people, all the time, everywhere. I preach to non-believers, I'll preach to believers. But how encouraging to know, because my assumption a lot of times is that there are no believers wherever I go. And that's also not true. There's a feeling of loneliness as we preach the gospel and wander around in our daily happenings. As we consider, God, what do you have for my future, for um, outreach, and, and maybe for the nations, for, for overseas missions. The realization that we are not alone. Christ has positioned us in a great position to reach all people. He is uh, their provision. He provides and is chosen to provide provision for others through the work of the life of a believer. As difficult as that is, maybe easy to believe and hear, maybe challenging a little bit, but more difficult to live out. So we are to walk around, I believe, that the gospel is for all people, and that Christ can move in the moment that we're in, and he can use the conversations that we have as we go. The third thing is this. The call is discipleship. We read in verse 19 of Matthew 28. It said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And, and verse 20. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be that should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Looking beyond our walls and looking beyond ourselves. And I know that I have the privilege of serving in the church when that happens. Like Carly and I have been on the receiving end of many, many blessings. And we hear stories about the way that you guys love and serve. And I know how you guys get people connected to your small groups. And you actually get them into church at this place to be a part of the family. And so the call is discipleship. So when we say that, it doesn't mean that we can't have a, a crusade for the lost or an event or a week-long thing to draw people in or to go out and, and try to evangelize the lost, people that we may never speak to or ever see again. Because that is a reality, that you may lead someone to Jesus and never talk again. That does happen. But if we're looking at this call to go and make disciples, there are some things that come along with that. So I want to do is identify those things which I have added a bunch of them after the fact. So they're not going to be on your screen. We're going to pause at point number three here for a little while. And I want to go to this idea of loving God, loving our neighbor, and loving others. Matthew chapter 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
trying to trap him. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus uh, not only told his disciples of this, but he epitomized this as Savior and Redeemer. In John 14, 31, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Jesus obeyed and fulfilled God's plan for him. God has a plan for his local church, the bride of Christ, to go into the nations. He also told the disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. John 15, 9. So Jesus is asking his disciples to do the same work which he showed them. And the greatest of ways to do. In John 15, 13 through 17, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Love for God and love for others are indispensable and fundamental marks of his disciples. Really two sides of the same coin. Now the ultimate expression is what we receive freely in Jesus that we're thankful for, his death on the cross, for our sins, granting us eternal life, resurrected on the third day, ascended to the Father in heaven, and sending us his spirit to dwell. Romans chapter 5, 7, and 8, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So short of the ultimate expression of you feeling compelled to go give your life for that of another person after today, I think there's probably no better description in the scriptures on with the way that we can live that out on a daily basis. I provide for you a scripture that You've heard probably almost every wedding you've gone to, certainly every wedding I've done. This is typically the, the, the uh, scripture that I'm asked, or one of them that I'm asked to share, or that somebody will share, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. And that's really where I was hit. When I felt like I did not show my son honor in that moment. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Loving God and loving others. I'm reminded, I, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again, of the pastor that said, Every day, I forgive so many people, because I hate so many people. <laughs> So we're not called to hate people, but we are called to forgive people. And some of you are thinking, there are many, many, many that I need to forgive. But how much forgiveness is also needed to be directed my way? To bear the fruit of the Spirit. We may look at this laundry list of love and think that we fall short. That's because we do. We may look at certain parts of it and say, hey, I'm doing pretty good there other parts that we're ashamed to even consider or talk about. Nonetheless, we are faced with this great love for God turned into love for neighbors and others as Christ has given us to do. In John chapter 13, 34, 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. A couple of other things to consider is that disciples, uh, they take care of each other. So as we go and, and make disciples, what I see uh, locally and then what I see in missions efforts with um, whether it's our uh, people that we support here as a church every year, 
or whether it's those um, that I would call personal friends from childhood who have been sent out into the mission field, is that there is a, an element of care, a care in how the gospel is portrayed in a foreign land, and a nurturing that comes with a self-sacrificial love birthed only from that of Christ towards a people that we don't know. But whom God may have given us some sort of holy discontent with where we are to go in love and to go and to do. I talk with my friends in the field and they say, you know, I, we've been in places where the community peace is already there. I have one friend specifically um, who said the community that, I, that, that he was formerly in, when they showed up, they were overwhelmed with the expectations of doing everything together all the time. Overwhelming. He said, I, I don't think there was a night that went by in, in I think the six years that he was in country where somebody wasn't sleeping on his kitchen floor, his couch, or his, wherever else, or, or numbers of people. He never had food because it all got eaten throughout the day. He would come home from work and not have anything to eat because they did life together. So there was this active community, but they began to see what it was looked like to be nurtured by that of a disciple of Christ. And that is what changed their community. So people can love to be together. We're designed to be together, but I think we miss the other part of it. Not just this hanging out and and. and kind of being together, or even culturally. Even though we probably live in a culture that is more separate, we've got our own houses and our, our big yards, we like our own space, and why don't we do things together? We might invite people, I think largely. You're not having a bunch of random people sleep at your house every night, is my guess. But even with that, and their understanding of community, they began to see self-sacrificing love of a person in the family who would leave their homeland to do life with people that God allowed them to love and, and burdened them to love. And to see that play out in real time. To take a step of faith and to do what needs to be done in that community. And really what these communities do in a, in a global sense is, is similar to what they can do in a local sense. Developing local churches, whether in public space or my friends, it's pretty much all underground. To be an entry point for the new believer. And we, whether you know it or not, are supporting these efforts every single day around the world with the prayers, the intentions, and the dollars that we send every year to our missions partners. Disciples are engaged in fellowship. There's a community feel to, to care for the needs and to be there at any time. But the fellowship piece is spending time together, but the goal is really to become of one mind. We're going to have a fellowship event next Sunday. I'm excited to do that with you. And maybe you'll only really get to engage in conversation with a couple of people. But I want you to look at it, not just catching up, the being of one mind and one goal in Christ. To take in this idea that we have a church that wants to be together and desire to spend time in each other's presence. But with the goal to make disciples. So maybe some, some food talk around the table then becomes, hey, how is your disciple making you go? Not to elicit a response like, oh man, I haven't been going very good. Or put somebody on the spot. I already know what questions can be asked of you now. <laughs> but to be an understanding that we are called to be of one mind in Christ. Philippians 127, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. For Pastor Daniel say, the goal isn't uniformity, but unity, purpose, mission, and of the mind of Christ. 
<coughs> Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 5. Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit of one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others, in your relationships with one another, having the same mindset as Christ and Jesus. We are pursuing the same goal, to be like Christ. Well, one of the things I love about youth ministry, and I think I mentioned this last week, is being asked difficult questions. I love it and I don't love it at the same time. I love it uh, because I'm glad that they're asking. I don't love it because I don't always have the answer right at the moment. And maybe even times I've forgotten the answer to the question. Not intentionally. But I had a student that I was speaking with one time, and it was in relation to the image of Christ. What is the image of Christ? How am I different than the other things that he created? And I, I guess came to this conclusion. Um, there's plenty of differences you can point to. And then there's some similarities, maybe the things that we share with uh, animals. But it came down to this. We are his imagers. We are his proxy. We, above anything else, were intentionally created to do the work of the gospel. We'll see that that's the main thing that separates us of, of the other things, and there's similarities maybe that we share, but God has created us and us alone. Now, creation speaks to the existence of God, but God did not choose to use the animal kingdom to preach the salvation message of Christ to the nations. He chose us. And we have a sense of urgency because of time, but also because we understand that He chose us. He didn't choose another group. There's not another group coming. I mean, there's other people, but there's we're, we're able to plan to go among the nations. And I say this not from a, a prideful heart. If anything, I say it from a heart that recognizes my own shortcomings fulfilling this great commission. Because I think a lot of us walk around day to day and we wonder is there more to life? I, I've accepted Christ. I'm doing the work of the church. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different good things. But am I going? Not, am I making disciples while I go? And we ask the question, well, what is discipleship? And we've given you some ideas of what that would look like. I spoke with somebody after first service who said that they were actually pondering this very question. Wondering if they had missed the mark. It was really neat to hear them say that what they thought about along the way was this idea to go and be about my father's business. To go and to be his imagers. Disciples also pray individually and corporately. Prayers often most focused on others. Most of their content aimed at blessing others or asking God's mercy upon others. We can do the same. Along with that, disciples fast. And so if we're, if we're reaching the lost, if we have teams of people who are doing that, or if we're considering doing that, or at least that we know that this is going on, Disciples around the world are not only coming to Christ, they're being involved in community. They're becoming one in unity. They're praying. They're fasting. As I talk to my friends, especially in certain countries, it seems to me like they live and die on prayer and fasting. They, they can't survive probably a week without this obedience task. Disciples do this, they worship. I'm not just talking about the songs that we sing, but the, accompan the accompaniment of our entire life in Christ as we go. I heard somebody put it this way. You define worship as responding to God's goodness and love, a life oriented by and directed to 
God. So our response to Him. Because He first chose us. He, he died for us and we have an opportunity to respond. To receive salvation in Christ but then to have the opportunity to respond to His love for others and His call to discipleship and His call to the nations. The other things that you would see if you were to go and be a missionary or to go and see what's going on and peek behind the mission's window all around the world is disciples that are confessing sin and accepting forgiveness. How often do we do this? Not to feel bad about it, but as a reminder that confession is good and pleasing. We accept God's forgiveness and His mercies are new every day. And we're not perfect and never will be. And the process of sanctification rolls on and we give our lives over and over again to Christ. To be made new. Fleeing from our former way of life. I think a great barrier to the gospel being proclaimed and a great barrier to individual discipleship even within the state of a local church is that of our former life coming back into play. We are new in Christ. No longer returning to the way that we used to live. Disciples study the Bible. Disciples suffer. Disciples make disciples. Suffering along with disciple making be kind of hand in hand. Because it's causing us to look beyond ourselves. Something that I genuinely think that we want to do, I want to do it. Yeah, go on, and I struggle with it every single day to look beyond my own home for what I have to accomplish, for what I have to do. Sometimes I just thought it would be easier to be a missionary. Anybody who's a missionary would laugh <laughs> loudly. Because I could just be away from everything here and live in an apartment and just maybe barely have my needs met, but I could just go preach the gospel. Maybe that would be the case, but when I talk to my friends in the field, when I talk to the ones who have been with people and walked through life with people that are nothing like them in any way, but have walked with them through the darkest of times, administer into and through great pain, I'm reminded that this is a task that may involve difficulty. That's going to ask me to, to live beyond myself. And maybe that is the constant that is true for all of us. Is a daily reminder to look beyond. Again, not because I have perfected it. Probably because I see it in the mirror every day. What shall I do today, Lord? And we fail, we dust ourselves off, and we keep moving. Number four, the task is unfinished. The task is unfinished. Matthew chapter 9, 37, 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field, just knowing that when we pray, he just may send you. And that's okay. Your harvest field may be a couple steps away. Maybe in your neighborhood, or your job, or in your school, or your friend zone. Maybe around the world. The task is unfinished. There are those that are lost. That need to be brought into the family. There are many that will say no. And never respond. But we don't approve. The harvest is born. The last thing is this. It's really all for God's glory. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. God received his glory. Now, one of the difficulties with preaching a message where you're uh, balancing tensions of 
Am I doing enough? Am I not doing enough? Should I do more for my neighbor? Um, I'm not doing well here, and now your pastor's up here telling me I got need to go around the world. Well, I'm not telling you to do that. We got to, may lead you to a place where you end up overseas. I, I, I don't know. That's something you're praying about. And for those that can't go, we pray and we give and we send. And we care for those who are. Uh, Carly and I, throughout our marriage together, probably much to her chagrin, have considered the work of missions. What could that look like if we left this place? Then we've been on some phone calls just to see what that looks like. And it's just amazing to hear the stories. And one of our questions was like, we have family here. <laughs> what do y'all do? Like, where are the grandparents? Well, there's technology. You can send. There's the ability to write and to call and to see each other face to face. But one of the coolest things we heard, this is a thing. There are missionary grandparents. There are those who maybe have been in missions or retired from missions or loved missions or their kids became missionaries. And they know that there is a mission field of missionaries' kids who need grandparents. And so, my buddy, his, his kids have all sorts of grandparents, apparently. Way more than we have for our kids. At home, when they come back to itinerate, or Skype, or call, whatever they do. But in the field, they're not alone. There is a family. I say that to suggest the fear that we have when we consider the call to look beyond ourselves, just in, in a general sense, because there's a cost that comes with it. Every day there's a cost. There's that guy could have been in Circle K, could have punched me in the face, thought I was some weirdo wondering about his hat. I don't know. Whenever we're willing to step out, there could be a cost. But, but what I realize the more I talk with the teams that are overseas is that They've counted the cost, and they go, and they keep going. And the joy complete in them to reach the nations far outweighs any suffering or hard times or difficulties. And I'll be honest, I still can't wrap my head around that, because I love this my own town. I love this my town. So, you know, some of you are thinking, man, I've got to recall the year. If I were with this place, how could I, how could I leave this place? These are things that God has already figured out far in advance. Because the task is unfinished. And he may not call any of us. But are we open to the task? So, that said, I want to end with this story. What I don't want you to do is leave here today and be caught in this conundrum of guilt and shame. I think I said it last week where you're going, this is another sermon where I'm going to get my hands slapped and I'm not doing enough. I need to feel bad about it. And that's not the case. This is a sermon of the joy of the work of the Lord that we all struggle with. And we gather around each other on a day like today and then we're sent into our communities, into the nations. Sometimes just with the love of God, love of God and our redemptive story to go. That's it. That's all we got. And we can do that. As, as we go. As we get the diet on the move, you never know. I'm going to have the opportunity to go with some students to Cedar Point tomorrow. It's a godly thing to do on the 4th of July. <laughs> and I'm already thinking about conversations. I mean, captive audience right there in line, right? But I've already given myself all sorts of excuses not to say the word of Christ at all to anybody. I've already, I've already thought of ten conversations that I would like to have and how I'd like to have them and how I'm not going to have them because I don't you know. We go and we have opportunities just as we go. So my buddy sent this to our group and he said he's in the field on a faraway land. Sometimes we give up too soon. Sometimes we think there is no hope for that, that person to find Jesus. My parents, by the way, this is it. Okay, we're done. All the while, Jesus needs a farmer to stick with his field to harvest the crop. I love this man. 
He says this, we have to fight for people. And the thing that I love about this man is he's been fighting for souls since we were 14 years old. And he's never stopped. And I'll be honest, when I compare myself to him, I'm like, oh, I'm a, I'm a pile of mush. I'm worthless for the gospel compared to this man. That's not true. That's sometimes how I feel. To hear this language, we have to fight he said, today someone has been in my life for four years. Listen to this. I've been ministering to them day and night for four years. And he still hasn't decided to follow Jesus. But he came to a church meeting at my house. Three years ago, people wouldn't even go near this guy because he was so prideful and pompous. Couldn't even talk to him. And today he sat humbly. Prideful and pompous. Now he's sitting humbly in a church the house. And he asked two questions. What does serving look like? And what does it mean to follow Jesus? Is it just reading the Bible? This final question was, how can I follow? Having had Bible studies together, listen to this, this is the work of the ministry. He just had Bible studies with this guy. I wish he had nothing in common, and maybe nothing that he felt like he can give, but the Word of Christ my friend loves to go for walks and jogs, and so we went walking together. My friend loves to camp and go on road trips, so they went camping and went on road trips. He loves Christmas and Easter, so they got invited. This guy got invited to the house. And so he says, he's done all this stuff with me. A ministry of presence, of being available, of having opportunities. He says... His heart, his heart is opening like crazy. If we would have created his openness of, of the possibility of salvation, a breakthrough based on how we found him four years ago, we wouldn't be anywhere close. I would have been gone a long time ago. He goes back, stay in the fight. You were worth fighting for. So now stay in the fight for the one that God has given you. And when they finally begin to follow, watch how they fight for their friends and family. Because they saw you fight for them. Who are you fighting for? And this crushed me as I thought, I need to fight even just for my son. And to raise him well and to show him what it looks like to be a godly man. For my other kids. To lead my wife. And as I do that, and to fight for my neighbors. And, and, and maybe the one that God has put in my path. And to consider what the future would be. As we send workers to the harvest. And he ended it with hashtag make disciples, hashtag fight for the lost. <laughs> the redemptive story of this missionary kid who was so far from God, a sinner in need of a Savior, who gives his life to Christ and then shares the gospel with his friend who was me and leads me. I was... He fought for me for months. And he never gave up. So as we remember, I would love to take the opportunity for communion. And so we, um, if you missed the opportunity to grab a communion cup on your way in, uh, Troy has some for us. So, hey, we're family. Raise your hand. Let them know you need to cast the salt or something. So we'll get you. In fact, I think mine's off stage. <coughs> The redemptive story that you have for your life, as we remember what Christ has done for us, you may be able to think back to a time where Christ called you and where you responded to his offer of loving grace. But have you gone back to that moment of inception? Not to rest in there and say, I did it once and then I've never done anything else, but... And not to have to go get resaved today, but to think back to the depth of where I was and to that which where Christ has brought me. When my sins were justified in Christ, I was a baby Christian trying to figure some things out. And as I've walked for a few years or many years in His name, to remember the new life He has given me. 
think about where I was before Jesus and where I am now that I have. Today we will receive communion together. We practice open communion here at Oak Bend Church. So if you are visiting with us um, and you are a believer in Christ, feel free to join with us as we partake. We remember. As we take communion, we remember. We remember Christ and we examine ourselves. I'd like to take a minute just to be with the Lord to examine our hearts. First Corinthians chapter 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the body together. As we peel back the opposite side of the juice. In verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whatever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whatever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Let's pray. Father, it is at your feet that we humbly bow, recognizing, examining our lives as they currently are. We will never measure up to your just and holy standard. Father, we are grateful for the redemption that you have offered us through the broken, broken body and spilled blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate this together. Remembering from where we came to where you have taken us. Dead in trespass and sin and brought to a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you were obedient to death on a cross. That you were bodily resurrected on the third day. That you ascended into heaven and sent your spirit to involve the life of you. We're grateful, Lord, for your sacrifice. Something we may take too lightly. Help us to remember your sacrifice. May it be the thing, Lord, that propels us to the work of the ministry. As we consider our faults, our ineptitudes, our ignorance, our inobedience, our, our roadblocks and issues and sins, and all the things that get in the way of the, the proclamation that you have called us to, to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus. Father, that you wouldn't just be adding a burden onto somebody's life. It's not what this is, Lord, but we recognize it to be the lifting and the freeing from who we were. Overjoyed with the work that you have done and are continuing to do. And to desire to be in unity together, and to be one with you, and to be your imagers, to delight and enjoy the opportunities that you have set. May our redemption story be so closely tied with so many others who are currently lost. Would you send out the word? Oh, be. 
and we can maybe dream together on doing something like that in the future as a church body. And I mean that so with all seriousness. Father, thank you for all of your love and provision as we go into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you did an awesome job. <laughs>